really nice to see you. I've been thinking about you all week. This is never easy for me. It is not only about a very difficult subject, very dark subject, um, also a very personal story. The, the idea is that to listen to one survivor puts uh, some, something of a human face on the enormity, the overwhelming enormity of the Holocaust, the enormity of the numbers, and the enormity of the evil. I want to make one little a sort of factual comment about that. If you know anything about the Holocaust, you're probably familiar with the figure six million, the six million Jews that were murdered. <coughs> um, and you've probably heard of the concentration camps, especially Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, Sobibor, those things. And for most of us, that sort of encapsulates the Holocaust. I was surprised very recently to catch up with research into the Holocaust and the findings that um, what I just called the evil is much greater than we ever thought. So I can't take the time to fill you in on all the research that's been happening. A lot of documents, both from Germany and Russia, have become available and have uh, extended our view of what really went on. So I just want to quote some of these figures to you. This is sort of the latest research. <coughs> Here is some of what has now been conclusively discovered. There were more than 42,500 Nazi ghettos throughout Europe from 1933 to 1945. There were 30,000 slave labor camps, 1,150 Jewish ghettos, 980 concentration camps. 1,000 prisoner of war camps, 500 brothels filled with sex slaves, and thousands of other camps used for euthanizing the elderly and infirm, performing forced abortions, Germanizing prisoners, or transporting victims to killing centers. The best estimate using current information available is 15 to 20 million people who died or were imprisoned in sites controlled by the Germans throughout the European continent. What, what is difficult for me when I speak about this is that I can't hide that I can't hide behind a title or a function. Uh, I do not have a PhD in Holocaust. So I'm not here as a expert. I'm here only because I lived through the Holocaust. So it's a very personal story. My relationship with the Holocaust is very personal. Um, and I discovered over many years that 
the way in which I used to start uh, is no longer okay for me. Uh, I used to start like this. Good evening. My name is Fred Lessing. I'm Exhibit B, Holocaust survivor. And at that point, I didn't know what else to say, so I just plunged in. I was born in 1936 in The Hague, the Netherlands, uh, into a family, uh, my father, my mother, my two older brothers. And I was four years old when the Germans invaded Holland and the rest of Western Europe. <clears throat> I don't remember very much of that. My mother tells me that we had a German officer quartered in our house and <clears throat> that I liked to walk around the house at four years old with his officer's hat. I don't remember that. Two years later, when I was six, <clears throat> and the Germans had succeeded in depriving Jews of all legal, all civil rights, and required all of them to wear a yellow star. Here's mine. With the word Jew in Dutch, Jood in fake Hebraic letters. And little helpful dots around the outside so you could sew it on properly. So in, uh, when I was six years old, in 1942, the, the uh, roundups of Jews started. So at that point, I would begin to get feeling very queasy. Like, what am I doing here? <laughs> and what are you doing here? What is this? And I found that I would have to spend a little time taking note of that. What is this? Why are you here? Why am I here? And since I usually speak to students at the Holocaust Center, it was easiest to start with them. They're students, so obviously, why are they there? Because somebody or a lot of somebody think it's an important part of their education to be there. So then I would spend quite a bit of time talking about, well, what is this? It's Holocaust education, and what is that about? And <clears throat> I will jump over that. Uh, I will assume, tonight I mean, I will assume that you're all students too. Probably you are, because why else would you come to somebody talking about the Holocaust? So what, what, would I be saying to the students about education? I would raise for them the question whether this Holocaust education makes any difference to what we call character, to um, the difference between somebody who risks their own life and their family's life by saving a Jew or saving a whole Jewish family? What's the difference between that person and the same person over here? Not the same person, a different person over here, but it looks just like the other person. But this person's only too glad to report Jews because you get $7 for every Jew that you report to the Nazis. Does education have anything to do with the difference between those people? It's a very complicated and difficult question, but a really important one. Because we, in times of great crisis, like the Holocaust, we, we turn to education as one of the things that will cure or prevent such things in the future. We have a great belief in education, and I share that. That's why I'm here. But it is extremely difficult. I can't think of any context more difficult than the Holocaust to believe in that, in that, whatever it is, that wish, that hope. It's not a fact that education can make it a difference, a moral difference. But of course, I like the idea a lot because it would mean that 
just talking to you here tonight, maybe somehow, somewhere, sometime, it will make a difference and, and somebody is, will end up being less likely to be a perpetrator. Maybe even less likely of being a bystander. Maybe even an active force against evil, prejudice, hatred, genocide. A nice belief, but in the context of the Holocaust, it becomes almost impossible to believe that there's anything to it. Why? Because this was not perpetrated by barbarians in some undeveloped primitive culture. This was perpetrated by what was arguably the most civilized, the most developed, the most educated country in the whole world. And they all participated. Well, we shouldn't generalize, I suppose. Not all. It's never all. But by and large, all. It takes millions of people to murder millions of people. <coughs> the business people, the teachers, the clerks, the professors, the doctors, the judges, they all participated. It would have been nice if our very first sort of apprehension of what this was all about or who caused this had turned out to be true, that it was a bunch of maniacs, crazy people, psychotics. But that isn't the case. They were just ordinary people. These guys that sat at the funeral, at the, at the uh, pits, the giant mass graves with machine guns shooting naked Jews would line up all day long. These guys at the end of the day would wipe the blood and brains off their shoes and uniforms and go home and have dinner with their family and just decorate the Christmas tree and listen to Beethoven. This, I, in my opinion, this is the hardest lesson of the Holocaust. It amounts to saying we're all capable of this behavior. And the hardest part of that is to include yourself. <laughs> so I leave the students with that problems. Education have anything to do with this? And uh, having told them what, why they're there, then I go on to talk about why I'm, why I'm here. But my wife then reminds me, well, you can't just leave it at that. You can't just leave it at education. You have to talk about what kind of education. And I think that's true. There's education and there's education. And so the next step would be to figure out what kind of education might be relevant to these questions of doing the right thing. And I won't go into that. I have my own ideas about that. I, I'll just say this. I spend a little bit of time examining what these guys, these, these these Nazis, what was their education like anyway? And I couldn't get along with it. It was so discouraging and so depressing and infuriating because what I discovered was that they grew up in a system, in a society, and I sum it up in this phrase, a society, a culture in which there was only one virtue, obedience. 
right from the moment children were born, their, their view of child raising had to do with <coughs> um, destroying what they call the willfulness of children. So right from the time they were born, they were intimidated, punished, including physically, until they were completely cooperative. Well, if you raise kids in that way, then you can be pretty sure that when they grow up, they will be people who will do anything you tell them to do without any sense of responsibility. And that's what they all said. They all said, I was just following orders. I was just doing what I was told. Don't blame me. It came from above. And there is a way in which we can't blame them for that reason. But the important thing is that we can all, we're all capable of this. Under the right, or rather under the wrong circumstances, that's a terribly difficult thing to, to admit, especially if you're looking in yourself. Because we all like to think that, well, I, no way. OK, so that's about a little bit about why the students are there or what education has to do with this. And I will now go on and tell you why I'm here. And in order to do that, I have to tell my story in a very strange way. I will tell it up to a point, and then I'm suddenly going to go into fast forward. And then I'll come back. And all of that in order to explain wh wh why I am here. So uh, let's see, where did I leave off? 1942. <laughs> I'm six years old. And um, we know that we're going to be deported. We, we're on the list of Jews in Delft. Delft, beautiful town near The Hague, where it's my hometown. And um, we were prepared to go. We had backpacks for the journey, the journey to what the Nazis called resettlement in the east, to board the trains, which in Holland were not cattle trains. They were regular trains. Um, and that we would be called. We would be called to, to be deported any time. So we had our backpacks. In, in the hall of our house, there was a, a, a closet with five shelves. On each shelf, there was a backpack. Three big ones, my father, my mother, and my oldest brother, Ed, who was 10 years older than I am. And two little ones from my other brother, who's only two years older, and me. And they were orange. And I couldn't wait until the day we would finally get to use these, because there was something in them. My mother had put things in them. I don't really know what. I think a little blanket, some crackers, a toothbrush. I don't know. For the trip, the train trip. But when the time came, we didn't take them with us. Um, we went into hiding. We broke the law of being good citizens. Um, here's how it happened. My brother and I, we were all home. It was a Friday. There was a guy in the kitchen repairing the stove. And um, we happened to all be home. And we got a phone call. Of course, I didn't know all this till much later. Phone call from Mr. Cohen, who ran a bookstore in Delft and was a good friend of my parents. And he said, you're on the list to be picked up within the next couple of hours. I was playing upstairs with my brother with a little toy train. My mother, my mother, who is the heroine of our survival story, um, it's just incredible. The older I get, the more amazed I am of what she was able to do. She called my brother and me down, and we could tell instantly from her voice that something dreadfully serious was going on. 
Consequently, there were no questions, there was no whining, there was no crying. We were totally there. She, she put her arms around us like this, and she said, um, you are Jewish boys, but if anyone finds out, they will kill you. And we are now going to walk out of the house. Don't take anything with you. Just put on your coat, your jacket. We're going to pretend we're taking a walk. Don't want to draw any attention to ourselves. And that's what we did. We put on our jackets. And I grabbed on my way out, I grabbed my teddy bear. This is not the same teddy bear. This is a stand-in teddy bear. My real teddy bear is part of an exhibit at Yad Vashem, the Israeli Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, an exhibit called No Child's Play. It's about games and toys of Holocaust children. And um, they asked me if they if I could give bear to that exhibit. It was only going to be nine months, and I had a very hard time separating myself. I used to carry him like I'm carrying this one. Because my story is not just a very personal story, it's also the story of a young child. And so children have a great deal of presence. Children and childhood are one of my main themes. Uh, so I grabbed my little teddy bear on the way out, and we walked out of our house into hiding. Now, this is where I go fast forward, okay? Three years go by, and the war comes to an end, 1945. We all survive. Miraculous. The survival figures in Holland are terrible. They're like Germany and Poland. Something like 80% of the Dutch Jews did not survive. Nineteen forty five, the war is over, the Holocaust is over, and everybody goes back to putting their life back together. This is another one of my themes, that two months later, I enter fourth grade back in Delft. And it's history, arithmetic, <laughs> penmanship. In those days, we had wrote with pens, you know. <coughs> Not a word. Nothing was said about any of this. Not even the war, let alone the Holocaust. The Holocaust didn't exist yet. It wasn't talked about. It. Nobody had amnesia, but nobody talked. I didn't talk about it. My family didn't talk about it. Nobody talked about it. Oh, a few artists, a movie here and there, a movie like Sophie's Choice or uh, Forget the name of the other. Here and there, there was a book, or and of course there were scholars studying. But in the general, uh, what's on top, what's in our, nobody talked. And this goes on for forty years. Forty years go by that nobody talked. Again, it's an it's a, a generalization, but it's generally true. Certainly, the survivors themselves didn't talk. A few of them wrote books. Why? It's a long, complicated thing, I think. I think mostly when it's over, people just want to get on with their lives, not sit around and shed tears over what happened. Um, there are other reasons. Post-traumatic stress syndrome, you've probably heard of that. Post-traumatic stress disorder. 
This is an example of that. It took Holocaust survivors about 40 years before they began to be interviewed and talk to each other in form groups and to begin to tell their story. Vietnam War veterans took 20 years. So it varies. According to what, I don't know. Holocaust, 40 years. And that included me. My job was to be a kid, to go to school, to learn, to have fun. The war was over, could not enjoy myself. And I did for three years, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, the closest thing to a normal childhood that I had. Um, though looking back on it, that post-war period was not exactly normal. But anyway, the war was over and my whole family had survived, amazing. Uh, at that point, something happens that completely changes my life. We immigrate to the United States. And I become a normal American boy. I go to seventh grade in Springfield, Massachusetts. I wear jeans, which were called dungarees back then. I play softball. I learn the language gradually. And from that point on, for the next 40 years, I am like most of you, just an American guy. I love it in this country. Like most immigrants, I love all those things about America, opportunity and freedom. And what struck me about America at that time the most was that everything here was very big. Cars were big. Cities, were, everything was very huge. People had front lawns that were big. In Holland, you have a little. And also that Americans seemed to me to be very generous. I went to school. I grew up. I went to college. I got married. I had children graduate school, got a career, came to Michigan for my first job at a place called Michigan State University, Oakland, which later became Oakland University, and taught there for the next 10 or 11 years. The Holocaust was nowhere in sight. It was not talked about. It was not forgotten. I mean, I'm but I never talked about it, it never came up. People that I knew in those days never knew about the Holocaust and me because I didn't talk about it. Not for any reason other than it just wasn't talked about. So looking back on those 40 years, they seemed like innocent and very happy years. I really became a normal American boy. And that was the end of it. Nothing bad had ever happened to me, I believe. And even my mother, who should have known better, believed that. I think she thought that, and she said something like this once, that since I was so little that I wouldn't remember very much. This is a very common error that parents make. If you want to abuse a child, do it when they're very young, and then they won't remember. So, um, then in 1987, a photograph enters my life. My brother calls from Chicago and says, I'm looking at a catalog of Holocaust materials and there's a photograph, a tiny little photograph illustrating it, and uh, it looks like a classroom full of kids, and he says, I think you're in it. Do you know about this picture? And I said, no, I don't know. Are you sure it's me? He said, well, I think so. I said, well, I don't recognize anything like that. Send it to me. And he did. And um, 
this picture ended up having a very powerful effect on me. I think even before I received it, I was nervous about it. The article that my brother had seen was about a book called The Courage to Care. Uh, it was about rescuers of, of Jews. Um, the same day that Ott had called me and said this, and I had said, send it to me, my other brother, he lives in New York, Ott lives in Chicago, I'm in the middle. My brother Ed called, as it happens, and I was telling him, I said, oh, Ott just called me earlier, and he was telling me about a photograph uh, and a book called The Courage to Care, and now Ed interrupts me, he says, oh, The Courage to Care, he said, I saw that on TV, he said, by the way, Fred, you're in it. So it was already spooky before I ever saw the picture. Once I did, I went into a kind of tailspin um, of, that's me? No, it's not me. That can't possibly be me. I'm wearing my star. I, was, I would have been in hiding. Where? It can't be me. It must be me. Yeah, it is me. And that sort of. For the next 20 years, I researched this photograph. And in a way, I'm still doing that. I'll show it to you in a rather enlarged version. I'll pass these around. I have several copies, and you can look at it more carefully. There are about 80 people, about four or five adults, and all the rest are kids of different ages. The little ones are sitting in the front row wearing their stars. And clearly, this is in Holland, because the stars they're wearing say Jood in Dutch. And I was. What happened to me was that I became extremely anxious. And at the same time, I became obsessed with having to f research this photograph. Where did this picture come from? What is it? What's going on here? And at the same time, I was falling apart emotionally with no explanation or reason why. I was getting extremely irritable. I was crying all the time about nothing. I remember one incident when my wife said, um, do you want some ice cream? And I said, ice cream? And I just dissolved in tears. And I couldn't understand. And it got so bad, I, I had nightmares. I couldn't sleep that I went to see a psychiatrist. I was that worried about it. And uh, he was himself a survivor, so I thought he might be able to help me. But I told him what I just told you, that I wanted to research this picture. and. He said, and I don't think he said it this way, but I heard it this way, why? <laughs> and that shut me down completely. And so I never came back to him, and I decided I had to do my own therapy. My own therapy turned out to be to research this picture and find out where it came from and what, what was going on there, uh, as well as going to all kinds of meetings and posting on the bulletin boards where people are looking for each other, this picture, and saying, does anybody know anybody in this picture? Has anybody ever seen this picture? Nothing. Why did I do all I forgot to tell you why I did all this. Why did this picture have this impact on me? Because I'm in it. I'm not only in it, I'm right in the front row. This very cute, curly-headed, kid in the front row. My hair was darker then. <laughs> and nobody in my family knew where this picture came from. And even when I went to Holland to uh, Amsterdam to, to the place where this picture is um, to find out, they didn't know much, much either. They just said it came in an album, a family album of pictures, and they didn't really know what it is. And I never found anybody else from this picture. And so I saw a movie at that time called Papillon. Maybe some of you know it, Dustin Hoffman. And, um, I can't think of the name of the other actor. <laughs> Steve McQueen, thank you. 
There's a story, a horrible story on, on an island, a rocky island out in the ocean, a terribly brutal, horrible prison. And Steve McQueen is always getting beat up and thrown into solitary confinement and tortured. And each time he survives, at the very end, he manages to escape. And he's floating away in the ocean, and the camera zooms in on him, and he says, I'm still here, you bastards. And something about that got to me. Even now when I say that, I, it's hard to control my feelings. Because I suddenly realized, it was like an epiphany, that they were all murdered. They are all dead, all my classmates. I'm the only one who survived. innocent children and just a very small contingent of the one and one half million Jewish children that were murdered and by the way they were not murdered in German engineering efficient clinical yes many died in the gas chambers but many others died in every conceivable horrible cruel, vicious, sadistic way that you can think of. Children weren't worth anything. <clears throat> Jews were called vermin. And if Jews were vermin, then kids were larvae. I think I will spare you the list of the ways in which they killed children it's really just too horrible. I told one group like yours, I don't, I don't think you can think of a way to murder a child that did not happen. At the very least, you must know about the medical experiments that were done on children. And babies who were thrown live into fires and whose heads were smashed against buildings and children used for and um, I decided that I was still here you bastards and that I can speak and they can't and that I would speak for them And that's why I'm here. I tell my students I talk to classmates is a really important relationship. You don't know that when you're going to school, but all your classmates were suddenly killed and you were the only survivor. What's that like? And so I became a witness. I made some kind of vow. I'll pass these around. And you can have a look at them. It's not such a spectacular photograph. It just has this horrendous meaning for me. And what does it mean to speak for them? I don't really know. In all these years, I don't really know. What does it mean to speak for my murdered classmates? except to tell you that that happened. Try to imagine a million and a half children ruthlessly murdered. And I was supposed to have been one of them, only they didn't get me. So that's why I'm here. Um, that's why I'm here, so now I'll tell you my story. <laughs> Back to 1942, we walked out of the house. We did not do what the Anne Frank family did, all stay together. My mother, who, as usual, I think, was the main architect of our survival. 
um, thought it would be better if we all stayed in, if we all hid in different places. And that's what we did. So there's really five different stories in my family. Although my parents were able to hide together most of the time, so maybe four stories. And I can only tell you mine. <clears throat> I was hidden out in the open. Many hidden children, as we are called now, have, were actually hidden in barns, attics, fake additions to the house, like the Frank family who lived, sometimes in pits, or toilets, all kinds of real hiding. But I was out in the open <coughs> uh, posing as a Christian child. My mother um, would take me pretty much door to door. Sometimes she had some dresses to follow up, looking for people who could take care of me for a while. She became a very creative liar. She told a whole terrible story of how we were displaced people from the southern part of Holland, Zeeland, the province that's mostly below sea level, that the dikes had been bombed and the land was flooded, and she and her husband were looking for a place to, to live, and could they maybe take care of little Freddie for a little while while they looked for a, a place to live? And I guess a lot of people must have said no, but some people said yes. And so I stayed with families um, who did not know that they were hiding a Jew. Um, and all this time, I was fully cognizant of what was happening and that I was a participant in this. So many years later, I realized that day when my mother said, you are Jewish boys, which was the first time I ever found out that I was Jewish, by the way. <coughs> um, I forget what I was going to say about that. Was I? Yeah, I know, uh, but that isn't what I was going to say. Um, I realized that I was now participating in this adult world and that I was participating in a completely fraudulent existence. And that I decided that what I should, I figured out all by myself, that I should become the sweetest, nicest, kindest, most helpful, most courteous little kid in the whole world so nobody would get rid of me. And I think I did a good job of that. Maybe a little bit of that is still with me. I don't know. Um, I did not stay any with any family very long. My mother would show up and take me to a new place because, you know, how long does it take to find a place to live? But she was, as I said, very creative. And so she added things to the story. She would say, can you possibly keep Freddie a little longer? My husband has been in a terrible car accident. He's in the hospital, and I have to deal with him as well as my other sons. And uh, can you keep him longer? And so they would. And, but never very long. A, a very interesting student, lady student, girl student, came up to me after I'd spoken and said, I didn't want to ask you this because I thought you might be embarrassed, but if you were I had told them that my name had been changed, such papers as I had at that age were forged, and my hair had been dyed. Um, and she said, well, if you live with these people, you know, when your hair is dyed, after a while, it grows out, and you can tell, and wouldn't they have noticed? And you know, I said, nobody's ever asked me this, and I don't really know the answer. Later, I realized that the, that the answer was that I'd never stayed anywhere long enough for that to happen. My mother would show up and take me to a different place, different family, very often a different religion. And my job was to 
fit right in. So I learned, you know, by watching them and faking prayers at mealtime. And so I was Protestant with one family, and then I was Catholic with another family. Kids are very good at this. Rapid adjustment. I was with one family that their religion was sport. So we went to all kinds of wonderful sporting events, and that was fun, but that didn't last very long either. I got extremely sick in one place, in Amsterdam. I got diphtheria, which is a pretty serious disease. And what I remember about that is that I woke in the middle of the night upstairs in a bedroom, and across from me was a mirror. And horrible creatures were coming at me out of the mirror, I had a terrible fever, I guess, and I got scared. I jumped out of bed and ran down the stairs in this house, this family's house, and at the bottom of the stairs was my mother. Her name was Angeline, and the first two syllables of that in Dutch spelled the word angel. And she kind of was that for me. She seemed always to appear when I needed her the most. So she was at the bottom of the stairs, and she took me back upstairs and took care of me for a while. And then she had to leave. She got a doctor who came in and gave me a whole bunch of shots. And then she had to leave. Uh, and before she left, she said, is there anything you want? And I held up my little bear because the dog had bitten his head off. And he had been headless for quite a while. And I said, I want a new head on my bear. And she took the breast pocket of my little woolly jacket, where the yellow star used to be, and made a head out of it for my little bear. And it's a totally different color than the rest of them. It's sort of a dark gray. And he's become a kind of multicultural bear. <laughs> that exhibit at Yad Vashem was extended to a year, two years. It's now been 17 years that he's been there uh, doing his bit for Holocaust education, and I'm very proud of him. But my oldest brother said, you have to have a bear when you talk. So this is a stand-in bear. Um, I, d I don't have a lot of memory of those years of hiding with different families. I do not remember their names. In a couple cases, I can remember sort of a couple of people. I remember the names of some of the cities. It was always in cities. I had never been in the country at all. Um, I ended up in a uh, place in southern Holland, very Catholic area there, uh, living in a little attic room of a boarding house. And there I got pneumonia. And again, my mother showed up. And she knew immediately that I was very sick. And years later, she told me, she said, you know, I had to find a doctor who was good. And I knew that she didn't mean good medically. She meant that he wouldn't betray me because in examining me, he would see that I was circumcised. And only Jews were circumcised, especially in that part of the country. And she did find such a doctor. And he said, wrap him in a blanket and take him to the hospital. I'll meet you there. And that's what happened. <laughs> and uh, on her way back to her own hiding place, she was caught. A Dutch policeman who looked just like Nazis, only they were black instead of khaki, um, happened to be an expert in forgery. And he saw that her passport was forged and arrested her. Um, and after that, she followed the same path that all Dutch Jews did, and imprisonment in Amsterdam and then by train to holding camps on the border between Germany and Holland. And from there, they were shipped in regular shipments, not to resettlement in the east, but to the death camps, primarily Auschwitz. 
Sobibor, Mauthausen. Um, my mother was not sent to Auschwitz. She was sent to Bergen-Belsen. Bergen-Belsen was not a death camp, although many, many, many people died there, but mostly because of a terrible typhoid epidemic. And Frank died there. <coughs> um, I might as well digress for a moment and tell you the rest of her story. From the moment she was, I told you she was a creative liar. From the moment she was arrested, she maintained that she was an American citizen. She had no papers to prove that. But my father and my mother and my oldest brother had immigrated to the United States once before in 1929 not a good year to come to this country and try to make a go of it. They had lived in uh, Boston, Jamaica Plain, <coughs> and so she spoke English. And because of her amazing memory, she knew the name of the grocer across the street and the telephone number and the number of the bus that you would take and the streets. And they apparently believed her because she was not sent to Auschwitz. She was sent to Bergen-Belsen, which was intended by Himmler to be a place for collecting what they called foreign nationals, Jews with passports from exotic places like Curaçao and uh, Shanghai and all kinds of. And the idea was Himmler wanted to have several hundred thousand of those kinds of Jews to, for prisoner exchanges. But that plan never materialized. There were only two prisoner exchanges out of Bergen-Belsen, and my mother was on one of them. And that's how she survived. Back to me. I was in the hospital for six weeks. <coughs> oh, I was going to say why I have so little memory of these days. It's for two reasons. One was that it was, and I knew this. I don't know how I knew it, but I knew it. The less you knew, the better. It wasn't good to know anything. One time, my mother accidentally mentioned the name of the town where she was in hiding to me. And then she said, oh, you're not supposed to know that. Try to forget it. And I did. I actually worked on forgetting it and succeeded. I think, uh, by the way, that kids know this. Kids, you say, you know, you, you say to them, "What happened here? You were here. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> well, you were here, and then, what, what did he say? I don't know. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it's very effective. Can't do anything with that. The other reason is that it was all sham. Nothing." of that what had any reality for me. I knew what I was doing. I knew that I was impersonating, that I was a forgery. <laughs> and so I didn't remember any of it. The only thing that mattered was to still be alive at the end of the day and to wait for my mother. And she always came, only then she didn't come. I was uh, picked up from the hospital by my father's half-sister, wonderful lady. She took me on the train into the country, which was totally new to me. And there we walked from the train station. There wasn't even a station. It was where they put a little stool next to the, you know, you step down. And then we walked for about 45 minutes on a dirt road. It was farmland, a lot of farms, and beautiful. I loved it. And we walked and we came to a kind of a manor house and not far from that was a little cottage. We went into the cottage and there was my father and my two brothers. It was amazing. It was wonderful. It was the end of what for me was the worst time, being all alone at six and seven, eight years old. 
maintaining this fraudulent life. There now followed another whole year before the war would come to an end. And I never ever leave enough time, including tonight, to tell you in very much detail what went on in that year. Um, I can sum it up. Well, let me sum it up by reading you this paragraph which includes the longest sentence I've ever written, I think. This is the other part. There were two aspects to this year. One was survival. There was nothing in this cottage. There, was no, there were no amenities. We had to go to the main manor house to get water every day. We had to look for fuel to cook on and to keep warm. We had to cut a hole in the wall with a stovepipe and a stove to keep warm. We had to find food. This was a daily phenomenon, hunting for food and fuel and, evo and avoiding German patrols. Sometimes we would go out at night and sleep in a ditch somewhere because there were rumors of German patrols. So I wrote this as the liber the other part was the coming of the liberation. The air was dominated now by Allied airplanes. Every night, American bombers would come over heavy sound, bombing bombers going to Berlin and Germany bombing, and they would come, an hour later they would come back, a totally different sound. All those bombs had been thrown out and the plane made a different sound. But also, all the things you see in movies, dog fights in the air. Sometimes we were afraid a plane would fall right on us. We once saw a dog fight between three planes way up. It was clear that there were two against one, and we didn't know what the, <laughs> which ones were uh, which. Uh, finally, one of them got hit in smoke and started spiraling down. And we were watching this in amazement until we realized he was going to fall right on top of us. It looked like, and in fact, he didn't fall very far away from us. It was a German plane. So good. One more crowd dead. Um, but there were other places. Another, another time, uh, an Allied plane came flying over our house at night on fire and crashed. And the next day we went to look at it. And it was one of the most shocking things I'd ever seen. The plane had completely disintegrated, and so had the two pilots. And they were scattered all over the field. Obscenity of war. So I wrote this as the liberation was coming closer. Slowly, like the liberation itself, spring had been coming closer and more believable, gradually at long last dispelling the also horrific and also seemingly endless hunger winter of 1944-45, during which we, my father, my two br older brothers and I, had, by hook and crook and almost literally the skin of our teeth, managed to escape both starvation and capture by the Jew-hunting Germans. For a whole year now, ever since my mother, the real heroine and architect of our family's miraculous survival, had been captured by the Nazis and disappeared into the fearsome silence and darkness of Nazi imprisonment, we, her husband and three sons, had been maintaining our precarious in-hiding existence in a tiny summer cottage with no amenities on a farmland dirt road in a rural part of Holland that she had rented for two weeks in order that the five of us might, after almost two years of hiding separated from one another, be able to be together, however briefly, before what seemed to her our inevitable capture. 
it had been for us a year of constant fear and danger and daily scrabbling, improvising, begging, stealing, and scavenging, and desperately against all odds, clinging to the hope that our mother and wife might also still be alive somehow, somewhere. I like to refer to it as the ultimate male bonding survival encounter. It was incredibly exciting for a boy, this battle in the air. Um, we learned all the airplanes, and we witnessed all kinds of dive bombing and explosions. An ammunition train not far from where we were got blown up one time. It was all amazing. I go to movies like The Battle of Britain, and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's just how it was. And I live near a little airport, and every now and then I still have flashbacks when these planes come over my house. It was very frightening, but it was also very exciting. Take a few more minutes, if you'll let me, and read one other thing about that. American Lockheed P-38 Lightnings. Amazing, very distinctive twin-boomed and double-tailed fighter planes that came roaring over our cottage at treetop height in broad daylight one morning in the very early spring of 1945 and left Ott and me breathless with excitement. It was our very first sighting of the good guys, our allied liberators. And we did, and we did see them, not only their airplanes, because when Ott and I alerted by the unfamiliar and thunderous no roar of their engines, had stormed out of the cottage to investigate, we could clearly see and, it seemed, make eye contact with the pilots, who, it seemed, waved back at us. Like the boys we still were, we were excited about seeing these most unusual airplanes, and like the seasoned, grown-up survivors we had become, we were ecstatic at this glorious and absolute visual proof that the war would come to an end, that it could come to an end, that it was possible and happening. It was a moment of emotional fireworks, a moment of awe and joy. Free, really free, these guys would liberate us. And soon, thrilled, we ran back into the cottage to tell my father. He was busily cooking something. Poppy screamed at him, you've got to see it, it has two tails. But our father, who had absolutely no interest in things mechanical, replied, I don't care if he has seven tails. <laughs> Ot and I were crushed. To us, they were like angels, messengers from a different, a better world. If it is possible to love combat airplanes, then I have always loved these Lockheed P-38 Lightnings, heralds of hope for an eight-year-old hidden child. The war came closer and closer. It got noisier and noisier. It was clear that one of these, this is in late April of 1945, that any day now they would liberate us, but it took a long time. And then came the day when it was really getting close and we had to go into a shelter that we had dug in the ground. And we were in the shelter together with the family, our landlord and his family in, in the manor house. Uh, we were in, the, in there three nights. And at the end, of the third night, in the very early morning, it got extremely quiet. It had been very, very noisy. Uh, bombs falling and, and uh, cannons, and you could even hear tanks and things like that. And occasionally, you could hear people yelling, soldiers, I guess. I don't know. We were in the shelter. And then it got very, very, very quiet. And after a couple of hours of quiet, we came out of the shelter. It was a gorgeous day. And uh, we've been liberated, liberated by the Canadian Army. It's hard to 
it's hard to tell you what that was like. It was hard to believe that it was really over. I was ex incredibly happy. We went into the village and everybody was crazy. Everybody was dancing and kissing and hugging and everybody. It was incredible that it had actually come to an end. And for us, this incredible happiness went over the top when only about two or three weeks later, we, we learned that my mother had also survived. That was really amazing. And where was she? A guy, a, a Canadian who had gone to Berlin to get Red Cross, Red Cross lists of survivors had come back with these lists and he was sitting there and this man had just found out that his own family had, been, had died in Auschwitz. And he said, yes, there she is, Angeline Lessing. And my father said, where, where, where is she? He said, she's in Algiers, North Africa. And my father, he always had these crazy things. He said, no, that can't be right. We don't know anybody in Algiers. <laughs> He said, these lists are very accurate, and they were. He said, go home and tell your family. And so I remember my father, uh, who had also picked up a pail of milk because the milk factory had shut down, and the farmers just gave away all their stuff. He had also, when he was cooking, uh, he was cooking a chicken because a farmer had, had a bomb fall on his chicken coop. Very unheard of luxury. Um, my mother had, they had asked her, where, where do you want to go? And she said, I want to go back to Holland and find my family. And they said, you can't go back to Holland. It hasn't been liberated yet. This was back in February or so. And they said, you can go to the United States or to Palestine or to a rehabilitation camp. And she said, I'm never going to another camp in my life. I'll go to the United States. My sister lives there. And she was on the gangplank of a boat going to Germany, I think. And she changed her mind. She was on the gangplank and turned around. <laughs> because, she said, if I go to the United States, it'll be years before I can possibly get back to Holland. So I'll go to this camp. And that's where she went. It was a United Nations rehabilitation camp in near Algiers, North Africa. And she stayed there uh, for a long time before she could make, before Holland, she had to wait for Holland to be liberated. And then it took a long time because of, you know, total disruption of everything you know, all over Europe. But she was very good at, about, very good at bribing guys with trucks and <laughs> she found her way to France and spent some time there and then eventually came to Holland and she showed up one night uh, when I was already back in school in Delft. Uh, it was in the fall, near you know, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. And uh, uh, my brother, my oldest brother, Ed, had gone to The Hague to, uh, he was part of a youth group of Jewish survivors. And he came home late constantly. Uh, sometimes he brought friends and my father got very angry at him. He always waking me up. We have one of these bells, not an electric, you pull on a knob and a system of wires would ring a real bell, you know. I said, stop ringing this bell, you wake me up, and here's a key. My brother's coming home, and um, it's kind of a dark street we're living on. We've been given a home and everything in it, all for free. It was all in a warehouse. They'd taken it all back from the Nazis who had stolen it all from the Jews. And so the house, we had a whole furnished house by the time my mother came back. Anyway, this truck pulled up, and this woman leans out of the truck and asks him, excuse me, is this number 32 Martin Trump Street? And he recognized her voice. And after that, there was just a lot of hugging and laughing and screaming and banging on the door and ringing the bell. So my father came down furious. I gave you a key, and there was his wife. It was a, a, a night never to be forgotten. It was just unbelievable. My mother was incredibly healthy. She completely recovered 
on the Mediterranean. She was suntanned, and she brought <laughs> she brought boxes of candy bars and things and, uh, she, and Arab outfits. It was amazing. We were up the whole night while she was unpacking, and my father just kept looking at her and saying, "Just let me look at you. Just let me look at you." For me. It, uh, she was again uh, this angel that had somehow survived, and uh, she was back. And that's kind of the end of my story. It, 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 uh, I think I, uh, what comes after that is I told you. I went to school for three years. Nobody talked about any of it. And then I became an American boy until 1987, when all of this washed over me. And my research into that photograph brought the Holocaust back into my life. And I found out with an adult's understanding what had really happened to me. And um, it's true, no German ever touched me. All the damage to me is inside. And I don't talk a lot about that. But it's there. And it's not particularly positive. There are positive aspects to it. You grow up like that, you really grow up. You learn a lot of stuff that's useful. But some of it isn't so great. But I'll end on this note. Um, I was talking to a, a group of, of a school group, and there's one kid in the back row. I guess he was a little future germ journalist. He, he was writing for the school paper. And he kept asking me, he has a little pet, you know, like journalists. And he kept standing up and saying, well, what were you feeling when this was going? When you were in that attic, what, what, what were you feeling? These are the same questions I ask now. You know. And I just sort of put him off and said, well, you know, as a kid, I was just doing what I was told. And he kept saying that, what are you feeling? And so I finally said to him, well, I think you deserve a better answer. And I said, what was I feeling? There are two answers, and they're both true. One is nothing, nothing at all. That's PTSD. You cannot feel that kind of life-threatening danger and survive. You cannot stand there and say, oh my god, this is terrible. I'm scared. I, that's not what happens. Furthermore, you don't have to make that decision. It happens by itself. It's an automatic shock reaction that what is called for is action. And that's what you do. You act. You do whatever you need to do to survive. And all the feelings are repressed, as Freud would call it. And this, to me, is a complete miracle. I think I became a psychologist partly for that reason. I was just fascinated by what happened here. Forty years went by, and none of this was present to me. And then I started crying and being nervous and being scared and having nightmares. There was no war. There was nothing going on. I had a, I was a happy life. It's like a chip on which it's all recorded. And it, in due time, it comes due. And it, you begin to feel feelings that go back 40 years or 20 years if you're a Vietnam veteran. And I spent those those years integrating all that adult knowledge of what happened to me. Well, the same kid at the very end stands up and says, so, well, um, did anything good come out of all of this for you? <laughs> I couldn't help answering him in this funny way that they sometimes talk. I said, well, duh, I survived. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. And then I felt bad making fun of him like that. And I said, but there is a more serious answer. Uh, I said, you do not survive this kind of trauma. And it doesn't have to be the Holocaust. It can be any life-threatening trauma that you survive. And you never again lead a superficial life. Your life will always now be about good and evil and life and death. And I said, you know, the evil part 
you can imagine, and I don't, <laughs> I'm too happy, too fortunate, too lucky to have survived, to dwell on the negative parts. But they're the good parts. And the good part is that everything is precious. Life is precious. After I drive home, after speaking, this happens all the time. I'm just, I think, I have a car. It's my car. And I, I have a house. I'm going to, it's my house. I have, I have a wife. I have children. I have grandchildren. I have music. I have books. I, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Everything that I have. And all of it is precious, especially the children and childhood. And I told him that. And I said, that's the good part. That's the good that came out of it. And that's, that very thing is very precious to me, that in the midst of all the horror that I can now feel, and that still affects me, there's also this overwhelming sense of how fortunate I am and how beautiful life is or can be, how magical it is. I feel as though in a way I remained a child, the way I now feel about, I'm walking around in the world saying, look at this flower, it's miraculous, it's just <laughs> all the things that kids learn and are so excited about, I am too, again. Thank you.